Greetings, everybody. Namaskaram, namaste. Welcome to this inaugural education webinar on Compassion Cannot Choose Healthcare Disparities from the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet, Enhancing Consciousness, Cognition, and Compassion. Recently established at Beth Israel Dickness Medical Center, a teaching, clinical, and research affiliate of Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. Inspired by the scientific discoveries that happens almost at an everyday basis in Harvard, and also from the spiritual and humanitarian work by one of the foremost authorities of ancient yogic sciences, Sadhguru, this center was started. Both components I think are essential for us, both spiritual as well as scientific component. The incremental scientific approach and the clarity and attention from the spiritual approach that I get is invaluable. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Good morning to all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you for joining. It's my fortune and privilege to have Sadhguru, a yogi, mystic and visionary, and stellar group of compassionate speakers from diverse group of uh, their professional interests. We have Dr. Nancy Oriel. She is an associate faculty associate dean at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Nancy. Good morning, ma'am. We have Dr. James O'Connell. He is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and is importantly president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Namaskar, we have, James. Uh, we have Teo Kassin Ghost Horse, who is an indigenous elder. Welcome, Teo Kassin. Teo Kassin. And we have Victor uh, Lopez Anthony Carmen. Uh, he's uh, from Harvard Medical School. He's also a Native American. Welcome, Victor. Mm -hmm. Namaskar to you. Since all of you are uh, getting exposed to Sadhguru's uh, humanitarian work and also spiritual work for the first time, or maybe shortly in the last week or so, I thought I'll contextualize by playing a short video of his four decades of work. Uh, that doesn't do really any justice, but this gives you a little bit of context for, for a very nice discussion and talk to follow. Can we play the video, please? In the next half hour, you're going to meet a man who has a devoted following across India and indeed around the world. While yoga and meditation are at the core of his teachings to promote individual growth, the work of the foundation covers conservation, education and health. And you'll find him astonishingly pragmatic on a range of very modern day problems. Let's meet Sadhguru. We have the necessary resource we have the necessary capability, we have the necessary technology to address every human problem on the planet. But the only thing that is missing is consciousness. We started a mass campaign and uh, six years I spent planting trees in people's heads. That's the most difficult terrain, believe me. And now in the last six years we've been transplanting it and that's happening much more easily. Action for rural rejuvenation is mainly aimed at rejuvenating the human spirit. This is an incredible movement that has started in Tamil Nadu. We want to see that this happens to the whole country and revitalizing rural societies. English and computer skills are very essential to make these children come out of the hopeless economic and social pit they are in. Whatever the nature of your business, ultimately it is all about human well-being. Isha Foundation, a non-religious, non-profit public service organization headquartered in southern India. We've engineered the outside world in so many ways, but we've done nothing about this one. If you want to know well-being, in is the only way out. An incredible rally starting from Kanyakumari reaching up to the Himalayas with the sole purpose of rejuvenating India's rivers. We are also launching another campaign called Kaveri Calling. This is 83,000 square kilometers of Kaveri Basin. We want to bring it back, at least one-third of it, back into some kind of green cover. We are launching a campaign called Youth and Truth in the month of September. Youth and Truth, unplug with Sadhguru, ask whatever you want. This precious life, where are you going to invest it? 
What is it that will be worthwhile today and worthwhile after fifty years? You invest your life into that. If you have to describe yourself in one word, would you consider uh, wildlife as two words or one word? It's Thank you for the video and thank you all for joining us and thank you Sadhguru. Can I go ahead? Please. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Nancy Oriol and she's my senior colleague and I've known her for almost 20 years. I think she's one of the most compassionate person I've ever seen. The common theme for today is compassion, I think. And all of you are uh, in one way or the other have contributed to the society. Nancy Oriol, she's a faculty associate dean, and she is mostly involved in um, integrating learning into the Harvard Medical School curriculum, providing pragmatic immersive learning experiences for students, while meeting the societal needs of the local community and fostering mutual respect, understanding and benefit. I hear that this is a favorite rotation for medical students, and they really go ahead and do it. An educator, she's a mentor and connector, she creates a curriculum and advises students as they gain skills towards becoming future providers who apply knowledge of how societal differences and racial equity affect health. This is an important lesson that many of us don't learn. Her community-based work began 30 years ago when in partnership with Boston Communities, she created the family van. Like we saw in that short video of Mobile Health Clinic, uh, she had started a similar van in about 30, uh, 30 years ago. This program continues today and her research on this model of care showing that it builds trust, saves lives and saves money has prompted widespread national adoption. She graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1979. She completed residency at uh, in my hospital and um, she was the first one in almost 80s, I think, to invent walking epidural, that is giving pain relief to women in labor, but also they're, they were walking, uh, they're not just bound to, one, bound to the bed. It was uh, really revolutionizing then, and it's adapted by many, many hospitals now. She's an innovator. She invented two medical devices, Neovac meconium suction catheter, and also to identify uh, when the fetus is in distress by using their heart rates. From 1997 to 2016, as Dean for Students at Harvard Medical School, one of her educational innovations was introducing mannequin stimulation. So this is, a, this is an inspiring field that she does. It's called the HMS Med Science Program, and she inspires the high school students to, towards uh, the biology courses, and it's a very innovative way of learning. So let's just look at a video of the family van uh, for Nancy Oriel, please. Can you play the video? The family van is a godsend. Since the family van been around Boston, I am with them, and I will never give them up. The Family Van is a mobile clinic that serves a number of different neighborhoods around Boston. We're reaching people who otherwise might not come into the traditional healthcare system. The healthcare comes to them. We believe that healthcare starts on the street where you live, work, learn, and pray, and that's why we're there. For the family van to be on a street corner on any given day, it's an opportunity for us to just sit there and listen and be the ears and the eyes and the hands that can make a difference in somebody's life for that day. There's a warmth, there's a human understanding that tells you that you are important. I feel at home when I go to the family van. You never know what somebody is going through, so our job is to make sure that they leave better than when they came in. I would not be cancer-free today had it not been for the advice that was given to me at the family van over seven years ago. I've been going to the family van for five years and I recommend the van to anyone. And I'm not just saying it, but it's true. There are resources to be shared. There's knowledge to be shared. And there's just an openness that is needed. The family van is a community of trust. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> That's impressive, Nancy. Thank you for doing this. And um, I wanted to start off with you. You know, as an anesthesiologist, you look at one patient at a time. What inspired you to take to this almost three decades ago? 
Well, that, um, Bala, thank you for that introduction. Sadhguru, thank you for bringing us together. Um, that's a great question. People often ask why, you know, as an anesthesiologist, why did I start focusing on the streets? And uh, to be quite honest, there was a moment where um, I, I was compelled to do it. So I, uh, I was an obstetric anesthesiologist. And on one particular day, I was called to the operating room to do a stat cesarean section on a woman who was rushed in, she was unconscious, and her baby was in, in severe distress. Um, you know, this, the surgery went well, the baby uh, survived, the mother survived. Um, and uh, afterwards, I wanted to go and meet the mother to find out what had happened. So, you know, after she regained consciousness, I went to see her. And she was from a, a local community in Boston. She was from, you know, what you call working poor family. She had health insurance and she had prenatal care. But when she started having a headache, she didn't know that that was a dangerous sign for pregnant women. And she didn't want to bother her doctor with something so trivial. And she didn't want to feel stupid. So she stayed home, you know, developed toxemia and had a seizure. As I was talking to her, I realized, you know, it, it was knowledge and self-confidence that had almost caused her baby's death. So I um, partnered with a medical student, a third year medical student, uh, because I didn't know what the answer was. I didn't know how to solve that problem. Um, I knew the issue was self-confidence and knowledge and access to resources, but I didn't know how to solve that. So, and, and not being trained in public health, I went to the people who I wanted to serve and basically spent two years with Cheryl Dorsey going to barbershops and churches and mosques and grocery stores and sitting on the corner and just asking people how to solve this problem. And out of that, the family van was born. Well, the family van has now been on the streets for 29 years. And we actually, we thought that it was going to bring resources to the community. We thought that it was about sharing knowledge and, you know, um, helping people access uh, care. And we've proven that we do that, in fact. Um, we have proof that it does, ha you know, we have outcome data that shows that it saves lives, saves money. But we have found it is so much more than that. So let me tell you another family man story. So in our early days, uh, we were actually part of the Beth Israel Hospital. And um, uh, the nurses on uh, the labor and delivery, uh, actually on the uh, postpartum floor used to collect money to give to the family van so we could, you know, share with the, you know, with our community. And one time they collected a little, you know, uh, uh, some money and they gave it to us and said, asked us to sort of have, give gifts to some children. So we had heard a uh, radio report that morning about a daycare center in Boston for children whose mothers had HIV. And in those days, HIV was not treatable at all. And so we thought, great, we'll, you know, we'll uh, call the daycare center, we'll ask them if we can bring some gifts over for the children. And when we called, spoke to the director of the daycare center, she said, she thanked us and she said, that's really very kind, but our children know their mothers are dying and they'd rather give their mothers a gift instead. So we, as mothers ourselves, thought about well, what gift can we give children that they can give to their mothers? And we realized the one thing that we had always gotten was little pictures of our children at the daycare center. So we decided to take our little Polaroid and go to the daycare center and take pictures of the children and have them turn it into cards for their, their, their mothers. Well, the word, we told the uh, nurses and the word passed around the hospital and then everyone started calling us because they wanted to join. The director of media production said he was going to set up a formal portrait studio in the daycare center. The nurses collected more money so that we could, we could bring, give the children gifts. And the uh, print shop gave us bills so they could make cards for their mothers. And so we went to the daycare center, took two days, you know, um, and we set up really a formal portrait studio in the daycare center. And there was a moment where I stepped back and I just looked at the scene and there were these little children lined up proudly and quietly waiting to have their portrait taken. There was the family van team sort of 
helping to, you know, move everything along and the director of the media services taking portraits. And as I watched that, I realized the family van was more than just bringing services to the community. It was a circle of giving. And it was that everybody who became part of it both gave and received gifts. And that is what we had become. And what's interesting, data matters. Um, we actually have done a qualitative analysis of why people come to the van. And one of the themes that comes out is this generosity narrative, that being part of this world makes you want to give it forward. And so our community feels that we are a gift and they want to be part of our giving circle. But it's more than that. And the title of this talk is Compassion Cannot Choose. Compassion finds a way. And so I need to tell you how compassion is the power behind the family van. So one of the places we used to park was what was called the outdoor drug fair. Um, and there was a woman who'd come on the van. She was pregnant. She was obviously addicted to drugs. And she'd get on the van and she'd sort of say, you know, ask us to help her uh, get into drug treatment. And, you know, we'd say absolutely. And we'd talk with her and we'd, you know, offer to call a drug treatment center for her. But every time she'd get scared and she'd run away and she'd say, no, 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 I need help now. Um, and she'd run away. Just fear just fear for herself, fear for a baby. And that went on sort of intermittently for, for a little while. One time she stayed long enough for us to actually make the appointment at the drug treatment center. Um, and she left promising to go. Well, we didn't see her again for, for many months. And then she returned and she had with her this beautiful, healthy baby. And she had a newspaper. And she opened up the newspaper and in the middle of the newspaper was this big advertisement of a beautiful baby. And the headline was healthy new beginnings in our new obstetric suite. And she gave us the newspaper and she said, this was her baby. This was our baby. This was a family van baby. Compassion finds a way. And that is what powers the family van. Thank you. Great stories, Nancy. This is unbelievable. Sadhguru, um, you talk about compassion and, um, you know, can you please tell us your views on compassion? <laughs> Namaskaram to all of you. Good morning, once again. Well, uh, I must tell you this, uh, this phrase or this title, as compassion cannot choose, came up about fifteen years ago uh, when we started a movement to help the HIV-positive patients. When we conducted large uh, events for them, hundreds of them came. The unfortunate thing is even uh, six-year-old, seven-year-old children were HIV-positive because their mothers and fathers were positive, whatever. So I was looking at what to do and I brought them to the center and I was uh, seeing how to help them out. Uh, this time I noticed that uh, people who were around me, people who were closely working with me, they all started resisting. They said, Sadhguru, you cannot bring these people here. I said, see, they're not going to spread the HIV in the air, all right? There is a certain way that's not going to happen to us. But they said, no, we are… Uh, we don't like it. Our uh, children are here, our uh, women are here, we don't want such people coming here. Then I said, see, uh, this is… Uh, if there is compassion in your heart, compassion doesn't have a choice. What is needed, it will do. If you're going to choose, you must understand there's nothing in your heart. You're doing what's popular. That's not compassion. Compassion is a passion towards everything. Uh, or maybe just before… Uh, 8.30, I just sat down and penned this poem. I don't know if it may any, make any sense to you, let me read this. It's called Life Affair, not a love affair, Life Affair. A passion with you, you and you, unbridled passion for all and everything, an unconstipated life and love, making life a love affair beyond needs and desires that make life a breeze or a scream as you wish. 
Will you ride the phenomena of life or wear yourself down with endless longing? So essentially, everybody has... Uh, everybody has passion for something. Passion is a wonderful thing by itself, but uh, passion runs out of fuel because it's usually focused towards one or two objects of passion. Uh, compassion means it's a all-encompassing passion. Your passion is non-discriminatory. You are equally passionate about everything. Once you are like this in your life, you will do everything that you can do. This is one thing everyone must understand. If we do not do what we cannot do, there is no problem. But if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. So essentially, compassion cannot choose or compassion essentially means that you do not become such a disaster. In your life, all that you can do will happen out of you. This is very important for every human being. So compassion is just an all-inclusive passion for life around you. When your passion becomes indiscriminate, you are compassionate. Thank you, Sadhguru. It's a great segue for uh, our next speaker, Dr. James O'Connell. And um, he's the president of Boston Healthcare for Homeless People, started almost 40 years ago. And he began his full-time clinical work with homeless individuals as a founding physician for them. He must, uh, do, he must do something for me also because I am also homeless. <laughs> He's, uh, he serves more than 11,000 homeless persons in almost two hospital-based clinics um, in more than 45 shelters and outreach sites in Boston. So even here, these, pe these people are there and these shelters exist. For the last uh, 40 years, sir, I've lived without a home all the time, traveling, living out of a suitcase. Because of the virus, I am now homebound <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. O'Connell graduated from the summer cum laude from the University of Notre Dame in 1970 and received his master's in theology from Cambridge University in 72. After graduating from Harvard Medical School in 82, he completed a residence in internal medicine at Mass General Hospital. And he served as a national program director for the Homeless Families Program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. He's also the editor for Healthcare for Homeless Persons, a manual of communicable diseases. He's been published widely. He's also uh, featured in ABC's Nightline and in a feature length documentary called Give Me a Shot of Anything. I wanted to ask you about this a little later on, uh, Dr. O'Connell. His first book, Stories from the Shadows, Reflections of a Street Doctor was published in 2015 and he's featured on NPR's National Public Radio's Fresh Air with Terry Gross. He has received numerous awards, including the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award in 2012, the Trustees Medal at the Bicentennial Celebration of MGH in 2011. Can we have uh, his video of his work, please? I came, my last job as a resident was to be the um, medical senior in charge of the intensive care unit. You know, so that was June and July 1st, I'm at a clinic, you know, a sort of a makeshift clinic in the shelter. And I kept saying, you know, how tough can this be? I've handled the ICU. Um, you'd be careful of those things when they come up because it never is true. Uh, but I walked in and it, I walked in and I, it's my first job. I'm, you know, late 30s now. I finally have a job. Um, and I'm walking in as a doctor and I'm thinking they want me. Um, and if you know the nurses, they're like, are you kidding? So they <laughs> said, the first thing I had to do um, was I ran into Barbara McGinnis was the name of the nurse who really was the spokesperson for the nurses. Um, and they explained to me that we had been trained all wrong, uh, that in residency, you know, you have to go very fast. You know, you're working all the time. You'll see three or four or five people in an hour, and you've got to get their, you know, get their chief complaint, diagnose them, and get the treatment going and move on. And if you don't do that, somebody's knocking on the door to say, can we do anything to help you move along? Um, and they said, that's never going to work with homeless people. You have to learn how to slow down. Um, and so they, I remember, never forget Barbara doing this. She took my stethoscope and put it in the drawer. She took everything I had that was medical and put it away. And she said, what we do around here is soak feet. Uh, and I was aghast because when you walk into the, to the clinic at Pine Street, around the periphery would be these really hardened street guys uh, all sitting in these kind of um, chair, you know, the desks that used to have the arms like this over them. And, have, and the nurses were soaking their feet. Um, and it was 
kind of magic. And as Barbara pointed out to me, you had to take, I said, these are tough people. They're not going to trust you until they know you're, until you know you're going to stick around, until you know that, they, that you will listen to them, and that you're not here for your own agenda, that you're here to take care of them. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Uh, O'Connell, for doing this service. And you have been doing this for 40 years. What keeps you going at it? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, wonderful to see you all. <clears throat> and I don't know if I, can you hear me okay? Am I? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> You know, I have, I've, I've been, first of all, let me say I'm so honored to be here and I'm so honored to meet Sadhguru and to be just a part of this. And as you probably can surmise from listening to Nancy, she's been a hero of mine for 35 years, <laughs> almost 40 years. So this is a real treat and an honor. But, um, uh, you know, I had never seen that clip before, so I don't, uh, I had never, don't even remember <laughs> saying all of that, so I apologize for that. But in answer to the question, like, what keeps us going you know, especially at this end of my career now, you know, I, I think it's exactly what I've been hearing from uh, all this morning. And that's it, it's the, you know, where <clears throat> at first I can remember when I first started taking care of homeless people, <clears throat> I was incensed by the societal tragedy. I convinced my job was to change this. People should not be homeless. <clears throat> and it took me a while to realize I was just a doctor. And then while I can advocate for all that, I had no ability to change the bigger picture. But I was invited into the lives of people who had suffered from the exclusion, <clears throat> from the poverty, you know, from the limited choices that they were given in this world. And they invited us into their lives. And as we got to know them over time, just as Barbara McGinnis, the nurse, after whom, by the way, we named our program, um, just as she had said, and it was somehow the relationships and the ability to help in small ways, sometimes larger ways, to alleviate suffering and to just be invited into the lives of everybody, I think is what has sustained certainly me. And I would argue most of the doctors and nurses in our program would say that about you. We rage about the fact that homelessness as a problem is worse now than when we started in 1985. So we have not been very successful at, at turning that arc. Um, but I think we have learned to deliver better and better health care to people who are still struggling with homelessness. At the same time, we've been invited into their lives. And much as Nancy described about the family van, I think our, our community unfortunately doesn't have churches and mosques and bar barbershops. They have park benches and alleyways and um, places that they live, but we've in, been invited into that world, spend most of our time visiting people there. Um, and as people slowly begin to get homes with these low, uh, um, sort of low uh, threshold housing programs, we've also realized we now spend a lot of our time doing visits to people at home. So there's been a sort of an, a full, you know, panoply of things we've been able to do that kind of keep us going. That's fantastic. And thank you for uh, what you're doing for uh, keeping these people healthy. Um, so talk about healthcare disparities, right? Um, so it's great that who's funding this program and how do you get support to um, do this? Um, you know, there's a, a long story to that and I will be very quick. So initially we were given a grant by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And this is in the early 80s. And I just wanted to share this a little bit. So it was a grant given because the foundation, which is a healthcare philanthropy and, and national, not international, um, had been responding to complaints by emergency rooms around the country that there was a new wave of people, these homeless people coming to emergency rooms. And the thought was, why aren't we out there giving care to them, preventing them from coming to the emergency room? So the foundation gave four year grants to cities around the country to try to um, become catalysts for improving the care of homeless people and trying to integrate their care into the mainstream. And um, to do that, the foundation required a coalition of stakeholders. And I say this because it's become really critical in our lives, much I think is the, the way Nancy described the, the event. So in 1984, homeless people in Boston <clears throat> gathered together and they had a law firm sign a document with uh, chiefs of medicine and the people doing it and the mayor. And they decided they wanted, I, I saved it, it's 1984, they wanted our program to be one of social justice. I was coming out of medical school and I don't think I had thought or talked about social justice since I was a philosophy uh, student back in the 60s. Um, <clears throat> but what they, what they were, did not want, it was really interesting to me, 
was that they said there are certain things they want. They wanted continuity of care. They wanted the same team to take care of them consistently, not to be a team on Monday that changes on another day that comes someday on a, a van at a different place. They wanted us to be integrated into the mainstream and be consistent. Um, and I, that kind of shocked me because I had taken this job in full disclosure because I, <clears throat> in, medic, in uh, residency, I became absolutely in love with end of life care, palliative care, and I was going to go on and do an oncology fellowship. Um, but when the city got this grant, the homeless people demanded a full-time doctor and they couldn't find one. So my chief of medicine, who is my beloved mentor, and to whom I can never say no, said he would delay my fellowship for a year if I would do this for a year. And so I thought, you know, as many of us would, this is my chance to give back, to do something good before I go on and do my career. Um, and so uh, when I got to the shelters, not only did I spend two months soaking feet and not doing anything medical to learn what the things were, but they also let me, invited me into this world where they didn't like people like me. I was coming to do good. I was going to do it for a few months or a year, you know, op get people to open up to me, share their lives. And then I was going to pack up and go do my career somewhere else. And that was the kind of fragmentation and loss that they were petrified about because that marked everything in their lives. Everything was lost. Um, and so they were challenging us to say, how do you make a career out of this? And um, as you can, as you all know, back in those days, there was no path. You had to like find a grant here or there or suffer. Um, and I can remember them saying, uh, your job is to figure out how to get, uh, get doctors and nurses to want to do this as a career, not as a, um, just as a like, six weeks or two, year, two years of good work. And so that's been a challenge for us all along. But what they also said was, in order to do that, they wouldn't let us use a volunteer. And I've struggled with this a long time. So they would, for five years, we were not allowed to use volunteers. And I, I live, breathe volunteerism. I think that's what we are all made of. We should be giving back. But they, they saw it. So the people we were serving saw it as charity. And they said, we want social justice. We don't want charity. And so they wouldn't let us get away with that. And I had every friend I knew I had gotten to volunteer. I, you know, I had cardiology friends and pulmonary. We were all going to, we had it knocked. We knew what we were going to do. But they simply said no. And we also couldn't use students, which shocked me. I didn't know any of this when I took the job because they had seen students coming to learn on them, to learn their physical exam, learn their stuff. And then they went off and did their career somewhere else. So they felt like guinea pigs. That's exactly the word they all used to us. Um, and then they demanded, so we couldn't do that. We couldn't use students. So all the things that I was used to in my medical training <laughs> were stripped away. And we had to learn how to just be consistent and be present. And what they were looking for were people who were going to stand with them in the light or in the darkness. And I think that set the tone for our program. And once you sort of fall into that view, as much as I thought it was wrong, it is, was brilliant. And it was exactly what our program has learned to thrive and grow. And the homeless people that we serve are part of, you know, they design and, and help us implement the programs and they sit on our board of directors and they are actually the people that hire and fire us. There's a very different experience I've had working in the hospital and other places. But let me stop there because I'm being, I could give you stories after stories and if I've got time, I'll share those with you. <laughs> we have a, um, a conviction now that if you try to go out and take care of, certainly in American society, if you go out and try to take care of a group of homeless people, they will teach you the weaknesses in the healthcare system long before you realize it yourself. And I can, I can give you decades of experience of that. So we always pay close attention to what's going on with the homeless because that often teaches us what to do the rest. Um, but the disparities are quite striking. I'll give you one example. I have a, I often show a picture that one of our patients gave us. It was a picture she took with a throwaway camera. It's a woman who lived under a bridge, not far from Mass General, which is my home hospital. Um, and it shows, 12 of her street friends sitting on park benches in a little park. Um, and it's her cher cherished picture. It's all her friends. Um, and she, she gave me that to hold about five years after the picture was taken. I had never seen it. She was going in for surgery and she asked me to hold on to her things. We have a big issue when people come into the hospital and have surgery. Most homeless people have to carry everything they own with them. So they don't want to come in unless someone's going to protect their stuff. So that was, I was being the protector of her stuff. 
But I looked at the picture and realized I knew every single one of those people. I, I spend most of my clinical life taking care of the people living on the streets who don't come into the shelters. And um, we knew them all. And in the picture, there were 11 of them. They were all in their 30s. Um, and they're sitting, having, you know, smiling, looking like a really wonderful community on a, in a little park, which is literally on the grounds of Mass General Hospital. And because this is Mass, Massachusetts, they all have insurance. We all have, they're all on Medicaid. And I was looking at the picture and saying, so a fully insured group of street people sitting on the grounds of my hospital, you know, 50 yards from the emergency room. And when I was looking at that picture five years later, it was one person still alive. And, you know, the, the realizing that, that here we are with, sitting in maybe the, the medical mecca of the world with all of our 12 academic teaching centers and um, you know, all the, we have 24 community health centers, you know, we have 12, 12 uh, academic medical centers, three medical schools, and the mortality rate of people living in the shadows of us was higher than any African country I could find. Uh, and so that disparity, I think, has haunted us ever since. The leading cause of, of death was cancer. It was not like what you might think. The second leading cause, cause was heart disease. So these are things, they were dying of things that we should be helping people with. And what we learned, as everyone knows all too well, that the, you know, the causes of all these things, what these folks have lived through, has been had happened just as the guru is pointing out. It's the education that failed them, the social services that failed them, growing up in poverty with limited choices, with awful racial issues going on. All of that ends up with people becoming homeless and living on our streets with so few options. Thank you, Jim. Um, now we are especially now we are sensitized to racial disparities and um, I have a question to Sadhguru. Um, we have healthcare disparities, we have racial disparities and so on and so forth. So I wanted to ask Sadhguru, what do you think is the reason for a disparity, any disparities in the group? Namaskaram. Well, uh, <clears throat> the roots of uh, ethnic and uh, racial disparity is elsewhere, as everybody knows, that's a different matter. But uh, largely, these healthcare di disparities are a consequence of economic disparity, which inevitably happens in every society. It is just that those who are able to ride the economic wave and those who get crushed by the same economic process, how do we take care of them in a given society is uh, in a way that's what we are looking at here in terms of health, because health is vital for one's life. When you really look at this, because economics are the basis of how much health… health care we can deliver to somebody. See, one important thing is, we are always looking at health care as a kind of a treatment process, which is very important uh, part of uh, health, I'm not saying no. But creating a culture of health in a given society is very important. I think that is where most societies, affluent societies have failed because there is no culture of health. Uh, eat badly, live badly and spend uh, three trillion dollars on health care, we think that is a formula. The whole world is trying to follow United States in this context. So let's say in India also in urban centers, the same culture is coming. Eat badly, live badly but you don't have three trillion dollars. That's the whole problem, all right, if you look at it as a global thing. So, right now, the biggest uh, industry on the planet is actually healthcare with a budget of 7.8 trillion dollars, US dollars. Next is the insurance, which is 5.3 trillion dollars. Agriculture and food is 5.1 trillion dollars. I feel if you slice it off the healthcare and insurance, and if you ensure that there is good food for the people, healthy, proper food for the people, because these people that uh, he was talking about on the street side, the biggest problem with them is they are eating the worst kind of food that you can consume generally, because that's cheap and that is available to them. Instead of spending so much on healthcare and insurance, if we ensure that the right kind of food is given to every citizen and a certain quality of agriculture is done so that what we consume is not working against us, what we consume is working for us. Then teaching them ways of being healthy, this has to become part of the social life. 
After that, in spite of that, if somebody falls sick, then of course, treatment. Now, this treatment is as expensive as it has become simply because of... Uh, uh, I know this, uh, I'm not speaking against something, but I'm saying the causes are that technologically we are going in a certain direction that every investigation becomes super expensive. Fifty years ago, what a doctor would uh, examine personally and find out what is wrong with a patient, today there are a slew of tests which cost so much. Actually, diagnosis usually costs more than... Uh, treatment, at least in India it is true and I'm sure it is so in United States also. So it's very important that we look at these things that uh, t as people innovate, technological innovations keep happening, we keep coming up with more machines and more machines. As hospitals invest heavy amount of money into these things, their charges keep going up because they've made an investment. So it is important that we equip our healthcare uh, people professionals, uh, doctors and nurses and everybody, that more human touch is needed than simply machine way of doing things because this will hugely bring down the costs and also a whole lot of people will get well simply with that human touch itself. So this is what both of them said in a way their work is about you know, a certain kind of human touch, people get well simply because they see somebody cares for them. That itself will transform their health situation quite significantly. There are uh, serious ailments which need treatment, which need technology, I understand that. But I think we are a bit overdoing the technology part in when it comes to healthcare. If we can identify those areas where technology can go down and more human touch can come in, particularly with diagnosis, I feel there could be, uh, you know, much lowered cost of healthcare, these insurance costs would come down and it could be available to more people. That money that is going into healthcare and insurance, if it is brought into right kind of natural farming and right kind of food being available to people, particularly those segments of society that you are serving, uh, who cannot afford good food, they just eat the cheapest possible food, uh, which should not be eaten by anybody, that kind of food they're eating. I think if we transform this, uh, some correction would happen, I'm not saying all problems will be fixed, but uh, it is always about pushing the solution versus the problem. Thank you, Sadhguru. It's a great segue for us to go to the next segment of this webinar, which is on Native Americans. Um, in the month of May 2020, um, actually Harvard School of Public Health organized a webinar on COVID in Native Americans, and there was an eye-opener for me and that was followed by Sadhguru's tour that I saw. He almost went to 40 reservations in 37 days of motorcycle trip. I actually wanted to contextualize that before we start this segment by playing that video of his uh, trip there. So he has witnessed these reservations in person and it'll be an eye opener for us. Can you play the video, please? This is an exploration of the American heart. What was beating in their hearts? what drove them to do what they did in their lives. Much of it, factually, we can never find, but in spirit, we can touch these dimensions. The world awaits uh, Sadhguru's next move, and ladies and gentlemen, he's off and he's gone. Sadhguru, ladies and gentlemen, Sadhguru, Sadhguru. We are so honored and so humbled to have you here present on our soil. Welcome to Turtle Island. There is a lot that modern societies need to pick up from ancient societies. They existed here not as exploiters of land, but as land itself. Beautiful words. Touch my heart. Thank you very much. Meeting, conversing, understanding, and above all, projecting the image of Native American people in a positive and relevant way to the rest of the world. This is the mission. I love that you're bringing the wisdom of the Native American people into the public eye because connecting to the earth right now and connecting back to nature seems more important than ever. This gift that I'm going to present to my friends is not coming from me. It's coming from this mountain, from the Creator. 
These are the most sacred to us. You can see his spirit. It's very strong. People are talking about ecology as a science. That way it will never work. Ecology should become our heart as it was for the, the indigenous people here. Their heart was land. That is one dimension that we really want to present to the world. That's the reason why I'm meeting all Native American leaders, medicine men and others, so that they express themselves clearly and their message is not of the past, it is most relevant for the future. I wish our leaders thought like you, man. I love that. I commend you, uh, said Guru, for thinking like that. I love that oneness mentality. We need more of that. Thank you, Sadhguru, for that uh, exciting trip. Wish I was part of it. Um, this, is, this sets a tone for the next segment, and we have uh, Victor Anthony Lopez Carmen, a Harvard Medical School student. Um, he is he, he's also a Native American, and he has been an active member of his community since receiving his traditional name and baptism on the Pasqua Yaqui Reservation. He's an indigenous youth mental health researcher, contributor at Teen Vogue, and editor for Global Indigenous Youth. Through Their Eyes, the first book on the global experiences of indigenous youth. He's a Martin Luther King, Udall, Bourne, and Fulbright scholar, as well as a recipient of the 2018 Native American 40 Under 40 Award. And currently, he's co-chair of the UN Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and an MD candidate at Harvard Medical School, where he serves as a co-president of the Native American Health Organization. He has a TED Talk, so I thought I'll show a clip of uh, that. Can you play a clip of Victor's, please? Hello, everyone. I stand before you as a son of two Native American nations. On my mother's side, I'm Pasco Ayaki from Arizona. And on my father's side, I'm from the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. Now, when I was young, my elders would tell me stories, like many indigenous elders do. So one day, my father pulled me aside, and he taught me about a principle that, that span time and space. He called it the seventh generation ethic. The seventh generation ethic is a social and spiritual contract. It says that we must know our past, but that in our actions, we must consider the impacts upon future generations, upon those who will follow us seven generations from now. Now, this principle has allowed my tribe and my people to thrive since time immemorial. It has profoundly impacted the way I live my own life, has the power to influence yours, and can guide our world today. Thank you, Victor. So um, we all know that, uh, especially from that webinar that I attended, Native Americans, there is a huge healthcare disparity. Their age is, um, their longevity is about five or six years less than the other US population put together. They have wherever they live, 80% of roads are unpaved. Um, there, there is a little amount of uh, you know, medical care that is available. They have twice or four times the risk for any heart disease or any, anything else like diabetes, hypertension, alcohol, liver disease, and et cetera. So we know that. I, I talked to Victor a week ago and Victor was so excited to converse with you, Sadhguru. So I want to leave him freewheeling. I know that you have done youth and truth programs all over the world where you ask, allow the youth to ask any questions they want. So go, go ahead, Victor, you ask anything you want. Wonderful, Victor, to see you here. I'm going to go to the next one. Victor, thank you. It's really an honor to be here with everyone. It's, it's, uh, it, it warms my heart to see the video of Sadhguru visiting indigenous nations and um, including some of my own. And thank you for taking the time to really uh, meet with us in, uh, in, in our territory. And I think that that really means a lot. And uh, not a lot of people get that experience. Um, I think a lot of people forget uh, that we are nations in, in their own backyard. And even looking at global health, uh, 
I don't often hear Native American nations mentioned in glo- when it comes to global health in the United States. And I think people forget that Native American nations are so diverse and we're basically different countries. We speak different languages. We have different spiritualities and we've been practicing them since time immemorial. So I think it's really important that you visited so many. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. Uh, as a Native American youth myself, I grew up experiencing and witnessing a lot of the disparities that uh, were previously mentioned. But I also grew up experiencing the tremendous beauty uh, of our people. And it was kind of this dynamic where growing up, I saw the ancient wisdom that my elders offered going to ceremonies, going to um, uh, sweat lodge, going to Sundance uh, with both of my tribes. And uh, when I got sick, my parents would take me to the traditional healer on the reservation before they took me to a Western physician. And so I got to see this, this beauty and it always, it just made me feel like I was at home. But at the same time, I got to see the alcoholism, the, the poverty. And in my mind, it, it confused me when I was a kid. I didn't understand why this was happening. I didn't understand why such beauty and such power could be in the same place as, as such dread and, uh, and just terrible outcomes that, that I would see uh, all around me. And I, that's one of the reasons why I was inspired to go into healthcare because I saw that as a way that I could contribute to my community as a way that, um, that I could do my part in loving future generations and loving my uh, descendants who would come seven generations after myself, uh, like I had been taught. And looking at the, the US healthcare system right now, I, I, I want to try to understand where we're heading when it comes to uh, Native American health and where these disparities are heading. Uh, when I look around, I see that, for instance, most medicals, I think 43% of medical schools in the U.S. have zero Native American medical students. And we make up 0.1% of medical school faculty, uh, 20 times less, over 20 times less than our U.S. population. And I want to try to understand what the U.S. medical system, what message is it sending to future generations of Native American youth? Uh, we always say to move forward, we have to understand the past, but we, we can't change the past, but we can do things that will help what happened and make life better for future generations of uh, everyone on this planet but when particularly like thinking of native american youth i would like to ask said guru what he thinks after his tour and his time with native americans what he thinks the medical system can do to really show that it cares about future generations with a particular reference to indigenous peoples Well, uh, mm, you know, we, uh, I decided to set up uh, our uh, Isha Institute of Inner Sciences at the head of a uh, trail of tears in the Cherokee land because uh, almost eighteen, nineteen years ago, I had a profound experience, a kind of an encounter with uh, a Native American a being or a spirit. After that, I couldn't take my mind off that and I decided to set up this center there. So we have a large center there now. Since then, I've been thinking of connecting with the Native American people, but uh, my schedules wouldn't allow me this kind of time. It is uh, in a way, unfortunately, it's thanks to virus that all my schedules got cancelled so I could plan a forty-day trip which I… which I could have never done otherwise, they wouldn't allow me to travel like this. 
And uh, because generally uh, Native American culture, their spirituality, their knowledge and their wisdom is not written down, it is always passed on from generation to generation. And that system has been seriously disrupted and generally it is in the lore of the Native American people that uh, wisdom and knowledge is blowing in the wind. So I thought if it's blowing in the wind, the best way to encounter that is uh, to be on a motorcycle and that's what took me. I definitely went to the Sioux, Sioux country, you, your father uh, from there, wonderful. And uh, well, I, I thought I knew plenty about the Native American culture, but I was just surprised at uh, various things that I discovered on this trip. I can't go into the whole thing. But uh, essentially, there were over five hundred nations within the present United States is something incredible. They all largely had their own independent languages and as you said, their own spirituality, their own traditions. Living so close together, still they maintained their individual uh, cultures for thousands of years because it's estimated somewhere between twelve to forty thousand years they have been here. It's uh, really amazing and incredible. And uh, above all, their health, their well-being, their, ev uh, their wisdom, everything is a kind of a mm, connection with the land. What I f uh, felt is for Native American people, there is… Uh, they don't live on the land, they are the land, they live like the land, which I feel is phenomenally important for this generation and the next generations across the globe to absorb that we live here like the land, not some kind of alien creatures who destroy the land, but we are the land. Most people realize this only when you bury them, but even when we are here, <laughs> we are the land. This very soil that we walk upon is us in many ways. So, in terms of health and medical care in the Native American societies, uh, it was, uh, you know, heart-wrenching to see some of the situations there, particularly the condition of the women. The number of women in a whole lot of reservations has come down significantly, either because they have left because the conditions are bad, or they… some people were complaining there's a whole lot of trafficking that uh, they're being forcefully taken away, and uh, also so many deaths in childbirth and those kind of things. Because uh, as Bala was pointing out, there are distances to cover, there is no proper uh, medical care system. I feel uh, one important thing is all the major reservations in the country, uh, a private institution like there are major uh, institutions which have the necessary endowments, uh, I mean uh, due to lack of… Uh, you know, my knowledge about all the foundations, like let's say the Ford Foundation or even Harvard Medical School or whoever else who has the necessary means must set up at least a basic care, if not specializations, at least life-saving kind of small hospitals in every reservation, this is a must. Many small reservations don't have any kind of medical care. This needs to happen if you have to save those lives especially young women dying at childbirth. Uh, these things stopped all over the world uh, quite some ago, decades ago, but unfortunately it's happening in pockets of uh, present-day United States. This must stop, I think this doesn't take much investment, this doesn't take much effort, it can be easily done. As uh, Victor was pointing out, it is important that uh, at high school, identify those children who have the necessary competence and every year, whatever is the number that you need, that many number of Native American children are taken into medical schools for training, which will definitely long-term enhance this uh, healthcare situation in their uh, conditions because uh, all said and done, I'm saying without any prejudice, uh, it may be little… you know, the way the reservations are, it may… not every reservation is the same, each one is different. Some of the reservations, the way it was, maybe people who don't belong to the, uh, that culture may find it little difficult to work in that place. So it's best their own community produces doctors 
And if uh, producing a full-scale doctor which takes eight, nine years is too much, at least like a paramedic kind of uh, people, if you produce which should not take more than four years probably, in four years if you produce enough of them, basic care, emergency care uh, must be set up so that whatever is the population there to serve that what kind of uh, emergency care that you need at least so that they could be transported out for safety, that much can easily be done and I'm sure uh, many of you will take it up in future and do it. If not the United States government, I'm sure many endowments will should be willing to do if uh, your uh, institution presents this, if necessary, from our center, if we can push this, we must push this, but uh, this may be too large a project for us, but if we can inspire many endowments in the country to at least set up this kind of thing, that there could be paramedics, if not specialists, who can attend to them immediately and if necessary transport them outside, at least handle uh, deliveries and things like that without risk to the women who are there. And above all, this uh, unbridled uh, sale of alcohol also has caused uh, severe damage and uh, these days uh, very enterprising drug dealers are there, they're all over the place. The youth are being taken up by this, so I feel uh, if all of them are not in, you know, they may not be oriented towards a long uh, study, I'm not saying everybody, Victor is doing wonderfully well, but I'm saying many of them may still have that, you know, tribal spirit that they don't want to get… sit in a classroom and study for years and years. So, if some kind of skill tra trainings and uh, small-scale industries that they can run themselves within the reservations, I'm basically saying youth, if they're occupied, if they have some pride in what they're doing, they won't go into these addictions so much, there'll be a better chance of getting them out. So, this variety of things have to be done if health has to happen. I don't believe health will come just out of a hospital and uh, doctors and uh, medicines and stuff like that. That is when health goes wrong, you go to your doctor. You don't go to your doctor to a health, I'm sorry if I'm saying anything wrong, but I always see that health is individual business, everybody should take responsibility for that. When it goes wrong for some reason, then you go to your doctor for help. You go to your doctor and say, I've paid my insurance, give me health. This is not going to work like that for anybody, particularly in… in societies where there is a pride about being a tribal uh, society. In uh, those kind of societies, it's important that their… Uh, their way of life is not disturbed, that all the time they have to go for monthly medical checkups, this, that. That's not how they live, that's not how we live either. I still live without… live without an insurance <laughs> myself <laughs> So, I'm perfectly okay with that. It's just that more opportunities for youth to engage in variety of activities, develop skills for themselves. And above all, what I saw in many of these tribes is what they have in terms of craft and culture, you can make them into tremendous uh, tourist centers where, you know, they could be a large earnings just because of tourism, both for the tribe and for the state and country. It could be great attraction because in the rest of the world, one reason why I made this trip across uh, the Native American nations is uh, because I saw in the rest of the world, they become invisible. People don't even know they exist. So, my fundamental goal was to make these people visible. People in the world should know there is a people like this. There are people like this and still are, not just in the Wild West movies. And the Wild West movie, image of a Native American person, he's… Uh, he comes half naked, uh, always hollering on a horse and shoots at whoever comes his way. This is the image that the world has, that there is no regard and respect for that culture because this is just by seeing a handful of movies, they have come to this. So it's very, very important to make them visible. See, it's always true for every human being, if you become visible, you would like to stand up in a dignified way. If you're invisible, you're underground, you do… you live your life whichever way. If you become visible, you want to make yourself, uh, you know, little shiny <laughs> So I think that needs to happen to that culture, they must become visible, they must have skills, they must have their own economy uh, going which sustains them. It, no, it need not be in par with uh, 
you know, modern economies, how they are, it must be enough for them to eat nutritious food, live a healthy life, and uh, if some healthcare problems come, we must have centers which should take care of this. This is not very difficult to do if a few endowments take it up. Thank you, Sadhguru. That was uh, a great uh, take-home messages right Thank there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to invite next um, Tio Kassin Ghost Horse, who is an indigenous elder and is also a member of the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation, South Dakota. Oh. <laughs> and uh, he's a host for First Voices Indigenous Radio mm -hmm. and he's a Nobel Prize nominee in 2016, nominated by the International Institute of Peace Studies and Global Philosophy. He has been a radio host and journalist, founder, executive producer for almost 29 years. And he's a survivor of the reign of terror from the 1972 oh. to 1976 on the Pine Ridge, Cheyenne River and Rosebud Lakota reservations in South Dakota. Uh, he was also awarded New York City's 2013 Peacemaker of the Year for the Borough of Staten Island. He was selected for a 2016 Native Arts and Cultural Foundation National Fellowship in Music. He was a nominee for a National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship in 2017. National Native American Hall of Fame nominee 2018-2019. He also was recently nominated for the nominee for the 2020 Americans for the Arts Johnson Fellowship for Artists, Transforming Communities. And 2019 Indigenous Music Award nominee for Best Instrumental Album for From the Continuum. So uh, Teo Kassin, you're here. We wanted to show a short video of Teo Kassin before we uh, start the conversation. I grew up between the Cannonball River and Standing Rock, the Grand River and the Morrow River and the White River and the Cheyenne River and the Missouri River. At age of five years old, they were giving us iodine pills to counteract the radio radioactive fallout that was coming from Nevada onto the western part of South Dakota. But what really came to play was when I could not drink my own water that I grew up with. I could not eat the food, the, the gardens anymore on my reservation. So I turned my attention away from me and said, this is what it's about. It's about Mama Earth. I have to do this because there's a, something at risk for Mother Earth. Thank you, Tio Kassin. As you saw, just saw, he's a master musician, musician and a teacher of the magical, ancient and modern sounds and performs worldwide. Um, what I found interesting was he's currently co-authoring Earth Mind, a perspective of quantum physics encoded within the Lakota language. Tio Kassin is a perfectly flawed human being and a sun dancer in the cosmology of the Lakota nation. Tio Kassin, take it away. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you for... <laughs> The articulation, Victor, and thank you all. It's an honor to be here. Um, i just like to say, Chante Washte na pe chusa pielo le unkipiki oha washtela. It means um, basically I give you my hand, uh, shake your hand with a good heart, and um, it's really good for all of us to be here. Quite honored to be here. And I, uh, all the statements that you said earlier, it's like a totally, I could say, just I'm just one big nod. I'm nodding and agreeing with everything. So I know that because, you know, when, when we talk from the heart, it's, it's part of that original intuition, that original intuition that is remaining unfiltered, coming from the heart of the earth, coming from who we are as, as community and unity. And when I hear compassion, I talk, of, I think about the uh, unselfishness and that it's really not about the individual, but it's about the, the earth um, as we understand as she understands us and i think that the biggest lesson is to know that we as humans cannot teach earth a lesson at all because our, our lessons are continuous all the time the breathing the air the water and you know just the food that grows us instead of us growing the food so you know i think the the connection the health disparities that we suffer if i use that word correctly is the fact that we have lost that connection, that intimate relationship with the earth. And as you see, uh, it played out in the American public and worldwide where peoples are more civilized and having culture. Um, we rely too much on technology 
And, you know, I know it's good in some cases in being, being that uh, uh, understanding, you know, having the education of the Western mind and yet never losing the, the, the intuitive values that we are taught as Lakota and understanding when I was young as uh, Bala uh, read, read the bio, somewhat of my bio, is when in 1978, when we were given final, finally given religious freedom to worship, talk, uh, use our language uh, and experience and, and tell our stories. And in a fast forward ahead in 1992, in grad school, I decided to understand that we had, we had to, uh, there was a largest uh, gathering in San Francisco of native people um, and this was to think without the Native American tag to it. It was the Native people, North American people, who gathered in San Francisco, 200,000 of us. And we were celebrating 500 years of, of, of survival. And I thought, well, out of that, we need to thrive, learn how to thrive like we used to. And what we need is a voice. So then I just started to uh, say, well, you know, I don't have experience with with bringing in the media and I had to learn about radio. And I just started a radio program to bring the voice, the, the, the visibility, at least of our stories of our oral traditions, because that, that encoded energy within our languages is less subjective and less uh, objectified, objectifying and actually deals with the energy. So to relearn how to describe the energy of our language and and then to describe the motion of what's going on around us, to, to, the relationship that we have is much more than the rationality that we are coming up with concepts when all these intelligences of the earth, the, the rocks, the, the, the stone, um, the water, the fire, the air, the plants, the animals, all those intelligences, I was thinking, why do we treat them as if they weren't? T intelligent, like they have no consciousness. And knowing growing up with, with peoples when I was young with the elders who were born in the 1800s and being young, four, five, six years old and reaching out and touching that transfers, transference of energy from that time pre-colonial here because those, their parents were here before the Westerner arrived into the geographical center of the United States or North America. And they still carried that uh, original intuition. And when I think about that innocence that is within all of us as native people that we, we may be landless, but we are not homeless. And that's what we're defining. The home is how to live with it and, and not to change the earth in order to, uh, to adapt it to, to our needs, but to adapt ourselves to the needs of the earth. And that's the great balance and, and the disparity that we, we will be successful uh, because I think that consciousness is alive again now. And through the experience I've had coming from those times of when, when I was young to now, I see something changing, but it's still rooted, tree roots consciousness with the earth, not just the grassroots mentality of, of uh, applying a program here and there which has brought a lot of mistrust for Native people. But, you know, we can see through that and adapt and include all those that have, have arrived here. So we welcome everybody here. We welcome everybody here. Um, all we ask is that we, we lose the thought of possession, that this land does not belong to anybody. But the fact is, are we using the energy of this land correctly or not? And I like to say it that way. And um, and just, just to the fact that, you know, when Victor said the seventh generation, and this is my own individual thought process is that every generation is the seventh generation, you know, because I've heard that about my generation when I was young. And so, yes, it, it puts us on an even playing field and that we, as, as a contu or earth men, earth, earth, earth beings, as a contu, we are the ancient future, the being from the ancient future now. So that we must stay in the present and not get too far ahead or go too far backwards. That if we are staying in this innocent, every moment is innocent. And, and then that, that is a, an understanding of consciousness of what 
of what all life around us is is actually telling us the lessons of the earth but i think one thing is is to not just go to the earth to listen but we go to the earth to understand how she is listening to us and you will find the greatest compassion of unselfishness that she has and you know regardless of what we do as civilized human beings there is all that culture that is that is springing forth now because of covid the, the intelligence of covid is bringing forth people putting seeds in the ground again singing the traditional languages you know the planting the seeds in the corn and 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 this is what i understood when i was maybe 14 years ago when the health disparities on my reservation in shine river is that we had to do something and we 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 did take an organization we took it home and and now it here it is 13 14 years later and it's through the children the children to, to be taught that culture once again the language because like i as bala said the the the, the the encoded physics the quantum physics is within the language and this language primarily is a verb it's, it's all verbs and it's less noun laden to describe the continuum that life is always and it will be always moving and so if that's too much then maybe i should stop right there yeah thanks thank you dear kasen um that's a great uh, you know segue for the next conversation what i thought i should do at the end of this webinar was to take home some messages already i think sadguru gave a list of things that could work that could be implemented right away we have a uh, compassionate minds here nancy jim victor yourself um so i want you all to think together and uh, brainstorm here to see what are the top two or three things that we can do or focus on um for the native americans nancy i'll start with you now let's say that you are being put in this spot that okay you have to go and take care of native american uh, <laughs> you know a particular village what would you do where would you start Well, <clears throat> the thing that I've heard from all of us um, is, and the thing that I learned doing the family van, it's it's about listening and joining in people's lives. You know, or it, it's not even joining. It's like people have to build their lives themselves. And if you don't have the resources, then as Sadhguru said, you know, help bring in the resources. But it is listening to the people and having the people design what they need. that's sort of on the on a big level my world and sagoris world of using mobile to get around to people you know the the native lands are are huge so i think there's a place for using mobile and the nice thing about that is you can then design it to fit the people it's serving and one doesn't have to look like the other each one is unique like each people is unique thank you nancy jim Do you have any thoughts, Jim? I I do, and I I am just uh, kind of um, in awe of what I've just heard from Victor and Tio Kassen. Uh, I did the thought I had, which re- generating for me, and I mentioned this before, is I as a student and as a uh, resident, I spent a lot of time on the Navajo Reservation in Shiprock, uh, working primarily in the hospital, but I spent a lot of time. with the the public health folks who drove out to the hills to remember going to two gray hills and many hills and it was my first time ever watching how effective doing care at home can be and how bringing the care into remote homes was so uh valuable but i also in resonating on what sadguru said is that i also realized the value of the small hospital for when there is there's a problem with a delivery you can avoid infant mortality if you've got the right stuff but if you don't have the hospital women will die. Um and so I realized it was a to me it was a nice blend of you know the the framework was there for how you work as a team and how you do care both in the hospital but out in the thing and I I think that model that I saw in the Navajo reservation while way under resourced I don't want to pretend it was enough was kind of the model that I think we should have around the country. So I think we have much to learn from the elders. the most powerful experience i had was going to the home of a navajo code talker 
who was in his 80s or early 90s, and he told me the story of the Navajo Code Talkers um, during World War II. And I was stunned to think that this person had probably saved my father's life, who was on an aircraft carrier in the Pacific. Um, so I think if I were reflecting on this, I am hearing so much about how we need to respect and listen to and be part of the land, which I learned a lot about from the, uh, the Navajo um, folks. Um, and then I also think that we can bring good health care. Uh, I love what Victor says is that we definitely need, you know, we just have not had Native American um, people training in our medical schools and training in that. And, you know, if we could get physician assistants, we can get nurse practitioners to join with Victor and others to go back to the reservation. I think the model of care is probably there and they will then teach us what we should be doing in our other places. Thank you, Jim. Sadhguru, thank you for giving a list of things that we should focus on, but are there any one or two things that um, you know, we as a group uh, can start doing right away with all the influential positions these uh, elite group has? <laughs> See, the simplest thing with uh, minimal budget uh, could take off is, as uh, Nancy is with you, uh, whether you call it a family van or you call it a Sioux van or you call it a Lakota van, whatever you want to call it, whatever the local people want to call it. Uh, I'm saying for specialized things, I, I noticed injuries, you know, I'm saying these uh, young people have injuries, fractures and sometimes bullet injuries and stuff. And they're permanently disabled, many of them because of these injuries, because they don't get themselves properly treated. So one man for injuries in every tribe, one for deliveries, one for small procedures that you could do and uh, diagnostics, one or two vans, if you leave it like this, I think that would be the simplest and quickest remedy before hospitals and before you train Native American youth in, uh, you know, medical care and stuff like that. This kind of things can be easily done and easily manned. It need not uh, have specialists, super specialists, simple medical care on the ground that people should not die of simple things. See, this happens uh, in all tribal so societies. Uh, like for example, in India, now uh, we brought it down significantly in the last ten, fifteen years. Otherwise, thousands of children were losing uh, sight because of conjunctivitis. Not because con conjunctivitis will take away vision, kids are just scratching their eyeballs out. All you had to do is tape their fingers and uh, the eyes would be saved, but there was no those two drops of antibiotic in their eyes. So I'm saying that and urinary infections were killing thousands of women across India. Now we've stopped that because the way that traditionally the women are made is they wouldn't go to a male doctor uh, for this kind of things and they would rather die than go to a male doctor, that's how they are made. So. These are… The, I'm sure in these tribe, uh, tribes, I noticed lots of injuries which could have easy, easily been handled by modern medicine, unfortunately has caused deformities in uh, people in Native American societies where I saw. Particularly, I saw this uh, in some places in the Hopi land where, you know, small injuries have left them disabled for long term. So, these things could be attended to, deliveries are very important, it could be attended to and uh, small procedures that are needed, this and that, small things will be there for every human being. If these kind of things and diagnostics are handled, that itself could make a huge difference to start with. Thank you, Sadhguru. Tio Kassin and Victor, do you want to round it up? <laughs> Go ahead, Victor. Uh, yeah, uh, I totally agree with, with what everyone says, and it's so inspiring to, to hear this. As a Native American medical student, I, it's, it's really inspiring and powerful. Uh, for me, I feel like two things. One, uh, a, a more serious effort to look at the recruitment of Native American youth into medicine as a, uh, as a public health response, uh, as something that will directly impact the nations that they're coming from. For instance, uh, I think every Native American youth uh, or the great majority have this drive to make, we want to help our communities. We want to do what we can to contribute. 
but there's so many factors that distract us as youth. And from my own personal experience, like uh, there were only six people from my high school that went to college and 50% of Native Americans drop out of high school. Uh, and there needs to be efforts by the medical system to see that as a public health crisis because we are the most likely to return to our communities to help. And once we get to that level where we actually can, we do. Uh, for instance, like for me, uh, being a doctor is, I see it as you know, being able to help uh, my younger siblings and other native youth from my tribe to become doctors, to speak to my patients in our language, to invest in community gardens and nutrition that will keep the community healthy, to create sobriety programs, to go to ceremonies with the community that I care for in the clinic, uh, you know, to help build sovereign uh, clinics and, and health systems that are tribal run and run by our people and designed by our people to, better, to most uh, contribute to our people in the best way. And Native American youth across this country, they have similar dreams that they really wanna do, but they're just, it's so hard for Native American youth to get to this point there's so many factors in society because of the oppression that we faced uh, for hundreds of years that has created this sense of, of hopelessness and poverty that we're, we're still, we've never given up to try to get past. Uh, but it makes it hard for Native American youth to get to this point. And the medical system needs to see this in a more complex way to really invest um, more upstream. And another thing, I think the second thing is seeing indigenous health uh, in a nation-based view. I think a lot of medical schools across the country are doing this already, but I believe it would be treme a tremendous improvement in indigenous health if every medical school focus, found a way to focus and partner with the tribes that are local and state. For instance, if Harvard Medical School were to partner with uh, Wampanoag in Massachusetts or University of Arizona uh, partnering with the Pasquayaki and to see these partnerships uh, as a way to build that local community between the local tribes and the medical school. I think that has so much potential, not only in recruitment, but to create this sort of goodwill between tribes that will flourish into partnerships that can, that can really make a difference going into the future. Um, I really love what uh, Sadhguru was saying about, you know, there are over 500 nations and each of us requires a, a diverse and complex understanding of the issues that are facing us. And uh, as long as Native Americans are seen as one race, as opposed to many nations who are, you know, in all essence, pretty much different countries that have gone through um, similar crises. Uh, I think that that, con that complexity will be lost and the medical system really prioritizes that specific complex understanding of patients and that should extend to Native American nations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, Dear Cassin, I'll give you your final word on this. Oh, hey, thank you. Um, so I grew, started this out with creating a, a, a culture of health. And again, I'll, I'll reiterate that, you know, everything comes from the earth. Everything is medicine in that way. And where is the knowledge, where is the intelligence to understand that, but through the languages that are still connected and still related with the earth. And I, I think that is the deeper stu study and understanding. And we, we need to discover, rediscover that knowledge, that intelligence of the earth, because you, you go into the language, it is telling you basically about the creation story and what is, what is you know, I, I would go back to, the first diabetic on the Cheyenne River Reservation was in 1968. What happened before that is, you know, the introduction of alcohol, all of the time pieces that a society would put onto a culture to destroy that culture. And I think about that and what happened to those peoples who, you know, had gardens. And I remember I said it before that the gardens contain the intelligence and and if we took care of that, we wouldn't have the disparities in, disparities in health. And so when you go back to our reservation, people are beginning to understand that the medicine is beneath their feet. You know, where's the relationship with that? Instead, my generation was said to go off the reservation to get that education. 
and miss the experience that you were growing up with and had to grow up with. And, you know, now we're interrupted and we want to be, uh, continue to be uninterrupted because we are including the American society. But, you know, there's, there's certain experiences that, that knowledge and information cannot teach. So this experience is much more valuable with the earth. And again, just for, um, just for thought is that the default thinking is not there anymore. We have to, we, we default to English. We default to the Western mind when our hearts are always defaulted within the earth. And, and when I think about that, it's, it's usually the peace with earth rather than the peace on the earth. So it's, it's learning how to have peace with the earth. And I think what we've been trying to have peace on the earth with, which is a domination form and, in the old language of Lakota, there is no concept or a word for domination, you see. And so in a relation, relational language, you have to relate to all that is. And that to me is very complex when it comes to a language that is based on, that is now laden as we're speaking now, this language. So just, just uh, you know, a, a thought process of that is that, my default has always been Lakota. So I come from that. And, and I think that it, it, in that relationship, we are so inclusive that we have dropped the thought and the feeling and the energy of exclusive. So in that way, Midakawe Oyasi means we are all in relationship with everything all at once. Thank you, Tio Kassin, beautifully said. <laughs> Um, so it was my privilege to host this educational webinar as part of the Sadhguru Center for Conscious Planet. This is our first inaugural education webinar. And we are uh, privileged to have his name and uh, to explore the science and spirituality together. I think they're seeking the same thing, the incremental step taken by science and the experiential holistic um, knowledge that comes from the spiritual uh, growth. I think both are important. So thank you, Sadhguru, for giving us the privilege to uh, have your name for the center. Thank you, and, and uh, uh, it's been most wonderful being with all of you. Uh, I have the highest regard and uh, empathy for the Native American countries. Uh, we must see how to... Well, we can't uh, recreate the past, but how to build a future which is not a process of destroying the past, uh, that kind of future. Uh, I think all forces should come together to recreate that. And uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, all of you highly educated people, having me uh, an illiterate person like me, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tio Kassin, and thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. And thanks, Isha Foundation, for organizing this webinar and uh, recording it for us. Thank you, Sadhguru. Namaskar. Namaskar.